Welcome back to another edition of History in Your Own Backyard. I'm Satoli. This morning I'm in Marietta with Harley Nolan, one of the most foremost historians here in Marietta who operates trolley tours. Is that right? Correct. So tell me about the history about Marietta. I mean, let, let's start at the beginning. Tell me a little bit about it. Marietta is settled by Revolutionary War officers. It's in the first uh, the westward expansion of the new United States, which was called then the Northwest Territory. Northwest Territory was a massive tract of land comprising some parts of five Midwestern states. And these officers at the end of the Revolutionary War were given paper IOUs. Being a new country at the end of a major war, there's no money really in the treasury, right. so they were given paper IOUs. So they, the officers from some of the New England states hired a Mr. Cutler to go before the newly formed Congress to put forth the idea that they should create a new territory in which they could redeem these paper IOUs for large tracts of land, land grants. Mm -hmm. They formed the Ohio Company of Associates. That was a sort of a land development company, let's say, these officers. And um, after the ordinance was passed for forming the Northwest Territory, they migrated out to Marietta. But before they came here, they hired their own surveyors to accurately measure the land where the city of Marietta would be built, which is between the Ohio River, where it's met by the Muskingum River. Okay. Because the rivers were the major forms of transportation right. in those early 17 and 1800s. So when those survey maps were completed, taken back to Massachusetts to where the officers were located, they pre-planned this whole community. Regular straight streets with rectangular city blocks and they set aside commons lands or parks along all the riverbanks. So it's a beautiful plan for a new city. So they started over the mountains and when they reached the headwaters of the Ohio River, they had a flatboat built mm -hmm. and they would then drift with the current 172.5 miles to Marietta. And after making that long, arduous trip, those officers also were receiving huge tracts of land. Most of them then stayed here. They didn't head back to New England. And how, how big were the tracts of land that they were getting? Very depending on how much back pay you're owed, but generals might have gotten several hundred thousand acres. So massive tracts of land, which eventually meant money because you could sell pieces and pieces right, and become right. quite wealthy. So right now we are seated on top of a gigantic Native American earthwork called Conus. That's C-O-N-U-S because it's conical in shape. Okay. And around us are buried more Revolutionary War officers than in any other cemetery anywhere in the United States because those officers all came to Marietta where the Ohio Company land office was located mm -hmm. to get their land grants and spent the rest of their lives here. Even though the city didn't exist during the Revolutionary War, no battles were fought here, but this is where you had to come to sign your name. And that land office still stands here behind the Campus Martius Museum, Does it? which is also where General Rufus Putnam's house stands. Those are the two oldest structures still standing in the Northwest Territory, dating 1788 and 1789. Okay. Both available for people to walk through and inspect. They're really fantastic pieces of architecture. So back to where we are, Conus. When they sent those surveyors out to measure where the city would be built, they encountered huge Native American earthworks covering most of what is downtown Marietta. They accurately measured those earthworks and placed them on the survey maps. So when those maps went back to Massachusetts where they started planning the city, those founding fathers decided to save the four major earthworks and plan the city around them. So they still exist here. So you can visit Conus, Quadrino, Sacravia, and Capitolium. And do you know if the other three were as large as this one? They are as large, but very different. This is a conical shape, very tall mound with a concentric ring around the base of it, forming a dry moat. Mm -hmm. uh, Capitolium is a flat topped rectangular mound. So it is not a burial site. It is a ceremonial site, flat top terrace. So it's like an outdoor church, okay. religious site as well as Quadrino, a very large rectangular mound with an earthen ramp coming down each of its four sides. Mm -hmm. And then Sacravia was a sacred 
processional path leading from the Muskingum River up to that first flat top ceremonial mound. Would have had 18 foot high walls on either side and it stretches what is now three blocks. So it's not just huh. a little path. A it was work. a grand ceremonial entrance to this overall uh, ceremonial site that we now call Marietta. And the site we're on now, is this a ceremonial site or a burial site? This is a burial site. And okay. we know that because when the first settlers arrived, their very first job was to build a cabin mm -hmm. and then get some crops in the ground so they wouldn't starve the first winter. But when they finally had a spare minute, they started to do an uh, archaeological dig mm -hmm. into the site of Conus. See, in that first boatload of pioneers, there are a number of them that had university degrees from Harvard and Yale. So they would have known something about doing an archaeological dig. So they started to dig into the site of Conus, where we are now seated. Mm -hmm. And they quickly found human remains. They stopped digging, reburied those remains, and then went to the Marietta City Council, the newly formed government here, and asked them to pass a law that said no further digging would take place and this would be forever held sacred. And how far back was this? 17? In the late 1700s, yes. Pretty progressive. Very progressive. It's one of the first, if not the first, preservation law in the new United States. Mm -hmm. And so it has not been dug into since that date. And they then decided to build their early cemetery around us, where all these Revolutionary War officers and soldiers still are buried. Okay. Got a question. Uh, you were talking about the building of the city. Yes. I noticed the streets are very wide. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. Some say that the width of our main streets downtown are so that a double team of horses pulling a wagon can turn without having to back up, which makes sense. It's very practical. Huh. And so Second Street, which is our main cross street downtown, at one point where it meets the other 90 degree cross street Putnam is five lanes of traffic wide mm -hmm. with parking on either side and right. then 20 foot wide sidewalks on either side. You know, a boulevard of a street, but very well planned for the late 1700s. Exactly. So it also, we had these beautiful commons lands along all the riverbank. Normally when you start up a city that doesn't have any planning, everybody wants the the water's edge because commerce takes place, boats mm -hmm. can arrive and all that. Here, it's all parkland or commons land. See, many of these officers were from around the Boston area. In the center of Boston, is called Boston Commons, a great big park. So right. we have commons also here, which are really city parks. But we have these beautiful commons along all of our riverbanks. And now we have a mixed use path, a paved path, so people can jog, walk, ride bicycles, enjoy the waterfront. And uh, it's really quite a, marvelous city plan. It is. And located in the East Muskingum Commons is a beautiful monument given to us by the Congress of the United States to celebrate the 150th anniversary of the signing of the Northwest Territories Ordinance, which was called the Sesquicentennial Celebration. Mm -hmm. The Northwest Territories Ordinance was signed in 1785, so 100, excuse me, 1787. And um, so then 150 years later, the federal government wanted to make a big celebration, so they commissioned a sculptor to carve this lovely Start Western Monument. And that sculptor, sculptor was Gutson Borglum, who later went on to great fame when he carved Mount Rushmore. So we have a large public piece of art sculpted earlier than Mount Rushmore. And then throughout the park, we have bandstands where we have weekly musical presentations of weddings, car shows, Civil War, Revolutionary War reenactments. Truly, the commons lands are used by all citizens. It's you know, wonderful, wonderful plan. And you were telling me earlier on one of the tours about the homes, how they're designed, and some of the homes have porches that were added on. Tell mm -hmm. me about that. When the city first got started, there wouldn't have been a lot of money in town. But later on, when oil and gas was discovered here, great wealth was produced with oil and gas. And so that was in the Victorian times. And so some of the earlier houses were in a much simpler style, such as the federal houses. Federal houses usually didn't have exterior uh, wooden ornamentation or big porches. So 
So when the big money hit in the Victorian times, you didn't want to be all out of fashion in a flat front federal house. They added big Victorian front porches and Victorianized the facades of their homes. And so some of the old original families in town would say that those people were just showing off their newfound wealth. They were putting on a facade, a new front huh. on their house, showing off their newfound wealth. So you'll see some houses on Fifth Street that originally were federal and then have all this Victorian addition to them. They're really quite lovely. But also, since Marietta is so early, Marietta was founded in 1788, we have all the different styles of architecture that came across the country. So federal, Greek revival, Gothic revival, and everything in between. So it's a great place to come and enjoy all the different styles of architecture that's been seen in the United States. And you, I think at one point <clears throat> you were talking about one of the banks downtown. It's the oldest bank in the Northwest Territory. Is that right? Yes. Uh, at the intersection of Front Street and Putnam Street is a two-story red brick structure. It's the first federally chartered bank in the Northwest Territory. And it was originally started in a private office of a gentleman, a Mr. Putnam, and as it flourished, he then came across the Muskingum River and built this lovely structure. Uh, we're very fortunate that most of our historic buildings are still being utilized. We have good occupancy in downtown Marietta. Mm -hmm. It's a great place to shop, walk, enjoy architecture, and um, we have a lot of firsts in town. We have that first uh, federally chartered bank, um, we have the first land office, that's the Hyatt Company land office at the Campus Martius Museum. We have a site of the, uh, the first Masonic charter, and then next to that is the site of the first religious service at the Congregational Church, a beautiful double steepled church that has a lovely bell carol in them, which they play the Sunday hymns every Sunday morning, usually starting around 10 a.m. And these are all the first in the Northwest Territory, correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So in my trolley tours, we take you through the two National Register Historic Districts in downtown Marietta. Mm -hmm. We have the Marietta District on the east bank of the Muskingum River, and then the Harmer National Register District on the west bank of the Muskingum. And that is named for another fort that was over here. That was called Fort Harmer. Fort Harmer was built as a temporary military garrison to keep illegal squatters from coming across the Ohio River from Virginia and making claims for land over here. And that was before the Northwest Territory was adopted. Um, Fort Harmer was built in 1785, and um, the Northwest Territory's ordinance wasn't adopted until 1787, so it was two years before the ordinance was adopted. But it was a very important military outpost at that time. Um, Lewis and Clark stopped there on their march all the way to the west coast and also Mad Anthony Wayne uh, came from Did there he? yeah, on his march to the Battle of Fallen Timbers. So at one time very important outpost of the newly formed United States. And, and speaking of officers, didn't you say something about a naval officer that's buried here? Yes, Commodore Whipple. Commodore Whipple is buried in Mount Cemetery along with General Rufus Putnam, founding father of Marietta. Commodore Whipple is the first Commodore of the newly formed U.S. Navy that has the great distinction of having fired the first shot against the British naval vessel at the opening of our Revolutionary War. Huh. And he settled here and was responsible for starting one of our earliest industries. He built tall masted sailing ships here in Marietta, which I always thought was a strange product to come out of the Midwest, but they would build the ships here float them down the Ohio River, all the way to New Orleans. Once there, put the masts up, sell them, buy a horse, and ride back to Marietta and start all over again. And they, they had no power at that time. No. And you didn't want your masts put up before you got down to New Orleans because they would have gotten snagged by the big overhanging tree branches right. from the riverbanks. Some say they even delivered Marietta produce to as far away as the island of Cuba. No kidding. Because once you had an empty hall by selling all your produce in, in Cuba, you'd then buy rum and sugar, transport that all the way up to the East Coast to like Philadelphia, Boston, the big cities, mm -hmm. sell all that rum and sugar for a huge profit, and there you would then sell your hall, your boat, and buy a horse and ride back over the mountains. 
So they were very hardworking, industrious pioneers. And then eventually, that was a short-lived business because an embargo act came along and nobody needed sailing ships at that point. And eventually, they, uh, other companies opened when it, steam was invented, mm -hmm. steamboats. So we became a center for uh, stern wheel and side wheel steamboats. The Knox family boatyard made many, many, many steamboats. And that's why we have the Ohio River Museum here in Marietta that tells the history of the different boat eras, starting with the engineless flatboats. And they have a replica of that first flatboat at that museum. Right. And then it goes into the Victorian steamboat era and then the modern diesel towboats that still operate on the river today. And where was the, uh, the facility that built the steamboats? Where was that located? I believe there were two. There was one on Gilman Street, approximately where the uh, boathouse is for the Merida College rowing team, and then another one on the Ohio River. And uh, they're long since gone, but their effect on commerce here in Marietta was very, very great. It was a big, big business. And then after the steamboat building died down, we got into furniture building. Uh, we had at least two major manufacturers. The Mills family had the Merida Chair Company, and then we had the Brick Weedy Furniture Company. They made mostly dining room sets. Hmm. And they were over in Historic Harbor while the Mills's uh, Merida Chair Company was here in Marietta, just about a block from us up on 7th Street. And Marietta is technically on both sides of the Muskegon River, correct? That's right. Um, Fort Harmer, which was really the first fort in this area, is over in Harmer. Mm -hmm. But when they designed the city of Marietta, it took in both sides of the Muskingum River. Now across the Ohio River is uh, now West Virginia. It became right. West Virginia during the Civil War. Before that, it was the state of Virginia, as it was after the Revolutionary War. Mm -hmm. But before that, it was the British Crown Colony of Virginia. Marietta's tourism industry is very fortunate that we have a diversified set of attractions. You know, we have the Mortuary Museum here, which some people think is kind of bizarre to see a mortuary museum, but Bill Peoples, the owner of the museum, collects beautiful Packard hearses and horse-drawn hearses. And some of these have been rented by movie companies because they? they are so beautifully preserved. And so uh, it's a great little museum. We also have the Campus Martius Museum that tells the history of the Western expansion of the new United States. Mm -hmm. And they contain the General Rufus Putnam House and the Ohio Company's land office. We also have the T Toy and Doll Museum over in Harmer, the Anchorage or Putnam's Villa Museum. Right. And the Faring House Museum, which is over in Harmer. Uh, Mr. Faring was a very early attorney in the Northwest Territory who eventually helped uh, draft the Constitution to form the state of Ohio. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, also have the Ohio River Museum. So if people are interested in boats, you can go there. So we have a wide range of interests, not to mention the beautiful architecture. But for me, since I run the trolley, I hear comments about you know, what's interesting, what do they like, and so many people say it's just a beautiful place and safe place to walk. You know, in so many cities they're afraid to actually get out on the sidewalk yeah. and walk. Yeah. Here you can walk and see beautiful architecture, mm -hmm. lovely landscape. Uh, you don't get lost in such a regular plan, grid plan. All the streets that are parallel to the Muskingum River are the numbered streets. All the cross streets are named for Revolutionary War officers, are most of whom that settled here. Okay. So it's very easy to find your way around, and there are all kinds of great maps available at our Visitors Information Center, which is at the Old Armory at 241 Front Street. They will help you in any way they can, answer questions, and give you these brochures and maps. So there's many, many museums. And I notice you have a fair amount of brick streets still here in the city. We had a wave of German immigration arrive in Marietta in the 1830s, and with them they brought two really valuable skills. One, they knew how to make hard bricks, so eventually five different brickyards opened in Marietta. And so with all these bricks, and we had wonderful clay deposits here, they made bricks for all of our streets and brick buildings, which are so important to us because we in the past experienced many, many floods, and brick buildings don't float. And so it was very important to have bricks in our buildings. And then the other skill, of course, Germans brought, they knew how to brew beer. So several breweries opened in town. 
we still have one microbrewery on Front Street, and um, they also built some beautiful houses. The one house on Fifth Street was uh, built by the owner of the Marietta Brewery, and it's a lovely piece of Victorian architecture. And where is that located? I believe it's at Fifth and Warren. Okay. We can drive okay. by it. And just curious, do you have any idea about the brick streets, how thick or how many layers of bricks are there? Is it just one layer of bricks? Yes, one okay. layer of bricks. They're specially uh, sized bricks. They are larger than a normal brick. Right. Normal brick is sort of shaped like a wafer, sort of thin. Mm -hmm. These are square in cross section. And if the top surface starts to wear, you can then rotate them. They don't do that very often. But um, the only street that has an underlayment of something other than just sand and then dirt is Putnam Street. That rests on a concrete base because they wanted a very stable base because that's where the streetcar tracks ran up Putnam Street. So those tracks are actually uh, supported by concrete and then they put the brick on top as the wearing surface and it's lasted very well. And some of the tracks are still down, yes. correct? The tracks are still on uh, Putnam Street. Mm -hmm. Many of the tracks were removed uh, when the trolley start stopped uh, their service. And then I'm told that a lot of the iron or in the tracks were used for the war efforts. Just when we also lost a lot of our cast iron fences around town, they were taken down to be melted for the war. Were effort. they? Yeah. Ha. Huh. Some of the the two best cast iron fences, I'm told, were taken down and stored in the basement so people didn't know that they were really keeping them instead of giving them to the war effort. Hmm. And they were put back up after the war. There's another attraction in Marietta that uh, both kids and adults love. At the Ohio River Museum is the huge W.P. Snyder Jr., which is the last coal-fired, steam-powered sternwheel towboat to have operated the Ohio River. And if you buy admission to the Ohio River Museum, you get to go down and walk through that entire boat. When it was donated by Crucible Steel Company of America to the museum, came in fully operational, under its own steam power, and everything still in it. The beds, the cook stoves, the tables and chairs, it's the only one like it left in the United States. And it's a real charge. It's floating in the Muskingum River, and kids love going through that boat. I took a tour through there a month ago when I was here. And just like you said, you walk through everything. The beds are there, the tables. It's like people just got up and left. And, and then the resting on the riverbank right above it is the full-scale replica of the first flatboat mm -hmm. that brought the pioneers to Marietta called the Adventure Galley. And then beside it is the oldest pilot house in existence in the United States. It was the Tell City Pilot House rested originally on top of a large Victorian steamboat from Tell City, Indiana. Mm -hmm. And when it sank, they were able to salvage the pilot house from the roof. The river is quite shallow. It sank before the days of the locks and dams. Right. So only the lower decks were submerged, not the pilot house on top. And so that was cut off, brought onto the riverbank, and used as a gazebo, basically, in somebody's front yard for over half a century until they oh, donated was it? it. Yeah. Huh. And then beside that is the... Uh, a uh, shanty boat. Shanty boats were engineless houseboats mm -hmm. that would drift with the current. And there were so many immigrants coming into the country in the middle 1800s. This is how they could drift down the river. And when they come to a city, they'd simply tie off to a tree trunk and go uptown and look for work. As long as work was good, you'd stay there. If not, you'd cast off, drift on down to the next city. And if you peek inside a bit, it's a complete little Victorian house. Huh. And uh, you know, it's got a pot-bellied stove and dining table and chairs. These didn't last very long. They were wooden halls, untreated wooden halls. And so they would have rather quickly rot and sink. But this one was saved because it was pulled ashore before it had a chance to sink and used as a fisherman's cottage just up the Muskingum River. And eventually the family that owned that cottage donated it to the High River Museum and it was restored. You, I don't know where else in the country you'd see a shanty boat. The Northwest Territories Ordinance, um, I told you about the sesquicentennial celebration for the 150th anniversary of his signing, and they made such a big deal of that celebration because Northwest Territories Ordinance is such a significant federal document. It is the first federal document to prohibit slavery anywhere in the new United States. It's the first federal document that allows women to inherit an estate 
Before that, it was like in old England where only the first male child could inherit. Right. So big deal. Women can now inherit. And also, it was the first time that the federal government said that all students should be uh, have a free public education in the United States. Huh. It also set out the pattern or model for how new territories could be expanded, meaning that system of government would start with a city, township, county, and state. And that was the model that, that was followed for everything west of here as they developed new states and territories. And who was responsible originally for the Northwest Territory that conceived the whole idea? Well, it was the Congress, the newly formed Congress, but that idea that it be a first free territory was basically uh, promoted by Mr. Cutler, the man who had been hired to promote the whole idea of founding the Northwest Territory. Um, Mr. Cutler, at the close of the Revolutionary War, held university degrees in law, theology, and medicine, and, you know, highly respected um, gentleman, and he sent his son out here to settle, and it was just downstream of Marietta, and since he was raised in a household that believed in public education, he, when he was elected to be our state representative, pushed for Ohio to be, um, to enact a tax to support our schools. Originally, mm -hmm. there was no tax to support schools. Right. They believed that everybody should be educated, but there wasn't a tax to pay for that. So as our state rep, he got Ohio to vote a tax to pay for our public schools. And he also started Ohio University in Athens, Ohio. And so their oldest classroom structure over there is called Cutler Hall. Is it? And is he buried here in Marietta? No, he is not. Since his home was just downstream of Marietta at Constitution, uh, his cemetery is down in Constitution. Okay. So that's maybe three miles downstream from here. Okay. His area where this house was built called Constitution because he helped uh, form the Constitution for the state of Ohio. He was our state rep along with uh, Mr. Gilman and then General Putnam. And uh, at the way that the United States is set up that every new territory, when they wanted to become a state back at that time, they had to vote whether they would come into the United States as a slave holding or a free state. And so even though this had always been a free area, they had to vote. And it was going to be a close vote. They believed that there was a lot of people that wanted to have slavery. Right. And so it was um, Mr. Cutler who placed the vote that allowed us to, it was that close. It was one vote off one way or the other. Was it? And uh, yeah, it was very important that uh, he vote. He was ill at the time, but they helped him get to where the vote was taken and we, by one vote, stayed, stayed with huh. the North. I did not know that. Yeah, it was, it was close. All right, I'm Jan Adams, and I'm the president of Washington County Historical Society. And I'm Josh Schlicker, mayor of the city of Marietta. And we're here to tell you how wonderful Marietta, Ohio is. The significance of Marietta goes beyond the region. Marietta is the first American settlement in the land once known as the Northwest Territory. I want to emphasize American settlement on the first federal territory outside the original 13 states following the American Revolution. The Northwest Territory is what we call the Midwest today. It's the land north of the Ohio River and west of the Appalachians. It was ceded to the Americans by the British as a concession of the Revolution. Today, the present-day states of Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota make up that past territory. What's important in Marietta is we've always held a significant place at the, as the beginning of it all. Uh, following the revolution, this territory was, uh, the leaders in Philadelphia thought, we need to get a grip on this vast territory. So they wrote a document called the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. That superseded the Constitution. And it established the government here. Important things 
were outlined in the document that would carry into the future history of the United States. It was the process for admitting a new state to the Union that would have equal standing with the, pres with the 13 states. It outlawed slavery. It had a Bill of Rights. It uh, also had civil liberties like the benefit of a trial by jury. And it had directions on the fair treatment of the Indian population. It is celebrated in Marietta with the Start Westward Monument and Park in Front Street. So let's get to our founding. Less than a year later after that document was written, in 1788, the pioneers founding Marietta were the first to establish this town under, that, under those rules. Among the first pioneers were American Revolutionary War officers, some college graduates, graduates, Yale, Brown University, and they were determined to bring law, order, education, and religion to the new western frontier. Marietta served as a model for the future. It has always been somewhat unusually focused on honoring our history. Marietta is obsessed with its history. Since the beginning, uh, we have celebrated Marietta's birthday, which occurs on April 7th, every year by various historical groups. In the 1800s, they were determined to, to keep this history by collecting and preserving historical documents and artifacts. These are all stored in the Campus Martius Museum, the Merida College Special Collections, and the Washington County Historical Society. It is because of these vast collections that David McCullough, a famed American historian and author, found the topic for his, unfortunately, final book. Um, he wrote his book, The Pioneers, The Hero Hero Heroic Story of the Settlers Who Brought the American Ideal West. We are receiving many more tourists now because of the publication of that book. History abounds in Marietta. We are a place of national history. And Marietta is home to about 14,000 residents, and we have a uh, wide range of uh, institutions in, in Marietta, uh, some very historic. Marietta College, chartered in 1835, is, uh, is, is here among uh, other institutions of higher learning. And we also have uh, many of the historic buildings still preserved. In, in we're sitting in one right now that, uh, that uh, has, has been through a lot and a lot of restoration, a lot of uh, volunteer hours. Uh, Mount Cemetery in Marietta, uh, has been uh, in existence for over 200 years. We have the most Revolutionary War soldiers buried in, in one site, in Mar Mount Cemetery. Uh, the, the history of Marietta is vast, and uh, we sit at the confluence of the Ohio and Muskingum Rivers, and that's where the pioneers landed uh, 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 many years ago and, and founded Marietta, and were named after uh, Marie Antoinette, uh, mm -hmm. so we, we, uh, we have a long history in Marietta. Uh, we like to, to boast that and pr preserve and protect our, uh, our history. Mm -hmm.